Thank you. Thank you. So can, you, can you guys hear me in the back? Do I need a microphone? I typically, you good? Yeah. Yeah, tell me if you're not, because I can get a microphone. Okay. Uh, I like to hear you. They can answer your question. No, they answered my question. You just didn't see them answer my question. <laughs> they answered with their hands, right? Yes, okay. Uh, I, let me, a couple of questions I want to ask you. Um, how many of you have been here all day? Wow. Congratulations. <laughs> that's, a, that's, a, that's a hefty day. How many of you uh, consider yourself libertarian? Okay, how many of you consider yourself objectivist? Okay, cool. Thank you. Uh, we just saw a, a, a fabulous lecture, so I'm, I'm, I'm always thrilled to come after a lecture that gives so much information and so much really hardcore, in this case, economics, because I can leverage off of that and it makes life much better. But he did miss one point. He didn't mention the movie from which he took Who Cares? You remember there was Danny DeVito on the screen? And this is a great movie, so it would be a sin if you didn't go out and watch it. It's not a terrible movie, it's a good movie. <laughs> the speeches at the end are classics. It's called Other People's Money. Other People's Money with Danny DeVito and Gregory Peck. I recommend everybody watch it. It's a fabulous movie. Okay. <laughs> Entrepreneurship. What is entrepreneurship? We've talked all day about entrepreneurship, but what is it? Because there's, there's a little bit of a confusion. There's the notion that often is portrayed that entrepreneurship means starting a new business. But is it? Because can you be an entrepreneur within a big company? And if you can, then what is it that makes you an entrepreneur? What indeed is entrepreneurship entrepreneurial activity. What does it mean to be entrepreneurial? Well, it's the discovery. To be an entrepreneur means to discover and to take advantage of what? Of your own Of what? Of your own well, not necessarily, because you might be within a company and, and, you know, you might, there are lots of ways in which you can improve your own future, and we wouldn't call it entrepreneurial. Entrepreneurial is a particular form of economic activity in which you discover and take advantage of what? Opportunities. Of opportunities to do what? Money. To make money. Very good. Entrepreneurial activity is discovery of opportunities and acting on it to make a profit. If you lose money, you're not an entrepreneur. Entrepreneurial activity is about making money. It's about making a profit. It's about producing a good or service that what? How do you make a profit in life? Where do profits come from? Success. From selling. Success. From success but what do you have to do in order to make a profit? To fulfill someone. Yeah, well, it's not so much that you have to fulfill somebody else's needs because often the other person doesn't know they have the need. As you know, I like to use my iPhones. I didn't know I needed one of these. Indeed, I would have denied I needed one of these if you'd asked me 10 years ago. I would have said, what? You have the need to communicate with others. And the is This is a lot more. Yeah, come on, guys. Somebody has to convince me I, need the need, I have the need. When cell phones first came out, I said, I don't need a cell phone, that's ridiculous. I have a phone at home, I have a phone at work. Uh, in between, I spend maybe half an hour. What do I need more than a phone at work and a phone at home? Right? That's good enough. And I refused to buy a cell phone. And indeed, a lot of people did. But then my wife was traveling, and she would go up, and she would spend a lot of time driving. And I said, well, buy just one, just for emergencies. And of course, within three months later, we both had cell phones, and we were talking on it all the time. I discovered a need that somebody else knew I had way before I did. The entrepreneur, the entrepreneur 
like a Steve Jobs, knows what I will need in the future way before I know it, way before I care about it. Production creates the need. It's not there beforehand. Yeah, we have a need for communication, but we don't have a need for communication with a supercomputer that fits in our pocket. That's something I never realized I needed. The entrepreneur convinced me I needed it and made my life a lot better. But let's go back to how you make money. How do you make money? By producing something that what? That people desire, that people want, and that they're willing to pay you more than it costs you to produce. Right? And when they give you that money, when I give up $300 to buy an iPhone, how much is the iPhone worth to me? More. Good, more, right? Not $300, but more than $300. And how much is it worth to Apple? Less, they made a profit. So who lost? It's win-win, right? So the way entrepreneurs make profit, the way what entrepreneurship is about is creating win-win relationships with people who are willing to pay you more than what it costs you to produce the good or the service. That's what entre entrepreneurial activity is all about. And what makes it entrepreneurial versus any other business activity is when what you discover is something new. Whether it's within an existing business or whether it's as your own company, if it's new and you make money at it because you're providing a service and good that people want and are willing to pay you more, then it's what you've done as entrepreneurial. Now, this sounds great, right? These are all win-win relationships. I'm creating something that you want, you will need to pay me. Everybody should be for this. Everybody should love this. This is wonderful. We saw the graphs. By the way, that slide is there, so you like me on Facebook and like me on Twitter. I'm trying to get a 10,000, um, <laughs> so please help. <laughs> We saw the graphs before. Usually I have to uh, paint them you know, in the air, but you saw the incredible, that's, that's entrepreneurship in action. Economic growth is a consequence of businessmen and entrepreneurs making money in win-win relationships with win-win transactions. This should be something that is celebrated. This should be something that we love. And yet we live in a culture that is torn, right? On the one hand, we kind of respect entrepreneurs. We look up to them a little bit. On the other hand, we want to tear them down, particularly when they become too, in quotes, successful, right? Why? What is it about entrepreneurship, successful entrepreneurs, successful businessmen? What is it about this graph, this exponential growth graph, that makes us resent it. Indeed, in the West, in the United States, but in many countries in Western Europe, we experience that, we know what caused that massive increase, and yet we've instituted policies that any thinking human being knows are going to reduce our ability to replicate that in the future. We constantly suppress our ability to grow. We constantly penalize entrepreneurs. Oh, we want to tax the rich. What does tax the rich mean? If we actually play it out, what does it mean? It means tax entrepreneurial activity. It means taxing making money. It means taxing providing goods and services that benefit all of us, that make all of our lives so much better. That's what we're taxing when we tax the rich. And yet everybody's for it, including, by the way, the rich. The rich in America always vote for higher taxes. Why is it? What is it that's so offensive about entrepreneurship, that's so offensive about capitalism, that's so offensive about making money, that's so offensive about being in business, that we want to control it, tax it, limit it, restrain it, and ultimately destroy it? There's something there, right? Because everything else we just saw in the presentation before mine, this stuff leads to good, good things. We all benefit. The pie gets bigger. And even the poor, while they, while they have a small slice, and maybe that slice is even smaller, 
than he used to be relative to everybody else is much bigger relative to what he used to be. Everybody, everybody is better off under capitalism. I mean, unless you're a wife-beating drunk and you don't want to work a day in your life, then theoretically, you know, the welfare state provides you more than capitalism provides you. But, you know, who cares about wife-beating drunks? I don't. So what is it? There's something about capitalism we find offensive. There's something about freedom and money and entrepreneurship we find offensive. Because what is entrepreneurship at its core about? It's about making money, right? We said that. But making money for whom? Right? Everybody benefits, but as an entrepreneur, what are you about? What are you seeking? Yeah, self-interest, it manifests how? In money. You're trying to make money. Most entrepreneurs are there to make money. But you're also out to make what? To enjoy yourself. It's a passion. It's exciting. It's fun. It's fun to be in business. It's fun to create stuff. It's fun to engage in the challenge that is the creation of a new business model, a new service, or a new product. Steve Jobs loved making these. It wasn't just about the money, although money was a big factor. It was also about the passion, his passion. Steve Jobs makes the iPhone for Steve Jobs. And what do we know about self-interest? For when we're this big, what are we being taught about self-interest? Good, bad, medium? Yeah, I don't know, by you Poles. But us Jews were taught that it's really bad. My mother taught me, think of others first. Think of yourself last. Don't be selfish. Don't be self-interested. Be selfless. We have an entire moral code that we've been living with for 2,000 years that has taught us that the essence of virtue, the essence of morality, the essence of goodness is sacrifice. Not trade, win-win, but sacrifice, win-lose. Right? You give and you don't expect anything in return. There's sacrifice for you. <laughs> We've been taught that the essence of morality is to give, is to share, without expecting return. It's to be, again, selfless. And that being selfish in any way, benefiting somehow from your activities, is tainted. Maybe it's not evil, but it's tainted. It's not quite right. You know, I used the example of Bill Gates, who made $70 billion for himself at Microsoft. Seven zero billion dollars. How did he do it? By providing goods to all of us, including everybody out there, including pretty much everybody on the planet, who bought his stuff in win-win transactions, voluntary win-win transactions. In other words, he made everybody's life better off, and he took a small fraction. $70 billion worth, but when you create trillions of dollars worth of value, $70 billion isn't that much. Bill Gates changed the world. He's a real entrepreneur in the sense that he affected everything in the world around him. The world is not the same place post-Microsoft as it was pre-Microsoft. And we are better off for it. And indeed, there's almost not a person on the planet who's not better off for it. And yet morally, from an ethical perspective, what do we think about Bill Gates? When he was at Microsoft, making $70 billion for himself. Eh, a great businessman. But morally, are we building statues? Roads named after him? No. So what if he helped everybody on the planet? He made $70 billion. He was self-interested. He did it for himself. Therefore, he's outside of the moral discussion. There's nothing moral about what he did based on the morality that we all believe in or have believed in. When does Bill Gates become a good guy? When he started to help the poor people.
Yeah, when, well, he's always helped poor people. This is the fallacy, right? He's always helped poor people, just in the past, he helped pe poor people by making money. That's how you help poor people, by the way. The best way to help poor people is by making money. Uh, one billion people, this, is, this is astounds me that this statistic is, is not celebrated. One billion people have come out of poverty over the last 30 years in the world. One billion people. We should be dancing in the streets. But you know why we're not dancing in the streets? Because the reason a billion, a billion people have come out of poverty is because of capitalism. And nobody wants you to know that. Nobody wants you to celebrate because they don't want to celebrate capitalism. The implication would be obvious. It's in China. It's in India. It's in Indonesia, in Malaysia, in South Korea, in Taiwan, in places that have adopted elements, little bits of capitalism, and boom, there's a billion people who are not poor anymore in the world. That's cool. And you know who helped them become unpoor? Those evil entrepreneurs like Bill Gates. Apple going to China and starting up factories. Nike, creating sweatshops all over Southeast Asia, help kids become, come out of poverty. But that thought is horrific, right? God forbid that news should get out and people would realize that capitalism actually is good for the poor. So Bill Gates helped the poor when he was at Microsoft, but he helped himself while doing it. He becomes a good guy when he leaves Microsoft. God forbid you make any money. And he starts his foundation. And now he's just giving his money. Giving we like. Making we dislike. Growing the pie. That we don't like. Redistributing the pie. That we like. We do. Morally, that's good. So Bill Gates now, giving his money away, now he's a cool guy. Now he's not a saint yet. Now you guys are Catholic, so you know what sainthood is, right? He's not a saint yet. Why? What's that? Well, but even if he died tomorrow, he'd still not be a saint. Because he lives in a big house. And he's still got a lot of money. And you know what? He even seems like he's enjoying giving the money away. And we know that sainthood and joy do not go together. Have you ever seen a painting of a happy saint? No. Our morality... Our morality demands that if you're going to be a good person, a moral person, a virtuous person, you better suffer. Because that's what sacrifice is about. Sacrifice ultimately demands suffering. So how do we turn Bill Gates into a saint? He'd have to give all his money away. He'd have to move into a tent. And really, we'd want him to bleed a little bit. Show us some pain. Now, that's a sick culture. That is a sick culture. That says that building and creating and making something that was never there before. That is eh, morally. Giving it away after you created it, that's good. That's a culture that says being happy and being successful and, and really applying yourself and making, making something of your life, taking care of the people you love, that is eh, morally. Suffering, that's good. Mother Teresa is our standard of morality. Nobody wants to be Mother Teresa, but that's the standard. So what do we do to entrepreneurs? We say, you selfish bastards. And they know it, right? Inside they know that they should have been Mother Teresa, but of course nobody wants to be, but they became self-interested. What do you feel when you, when, you be, when you should be one thing, but you really do something completely different? What do you feel inside? Guilt. 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 Businessmen, at least in the United States, I don't know about Poland, I suspect here they feel even more guilty, feel real guilt. Feel real guilt. Somebody like Bill Gates is not giving his money away because he believes it will do the world so much good, more good than Microsoft. He's giving his money away because he feels guilty about making it. He's giving his money away to buy himself into heaven, whether he believes in heaven or not. He's trying to buy himself your love. But why don't we love him originally when he built and created and made all this stuff? Because we have a morality that tells us that's bad. So, in my view, if we love entrepreneurship, 
If we love capitalism, business, freedom, liberty, then we have to question more than just economic theory. Right, that's relatively easy. You saw the hockey stick. <laughs> I mean, what do they got to argue against it? Nothing. And yet, they do argue against it. Not on economic grounds, in my view. They have no economic theory behind them. You have to argue more than politics. Politics is the last straw to fall. The real battle, the real battle we have to fight is a moral battle. As long as people perceive the Bill Gateses of the world as eh or negative, we will lose. As long as entrepreneurs are made to feel guilty for their success, guilty for their achievement, guilty for making the world a better place for themselves, we will lose. Economic facts don't matter to people. You can explain all day long why the minimum wage causes unemployment among the poorest of the poor and people still vote for it. They ignore the economic fact. They do what they feel is good. And if we have to sacrifice a few young people so that other poor people can be a little better off, which is exactly what the minimum wage does, it redistributes wealth from the very, very poor to the slightly less poor, so be it. Sacrifice is cool. Sacrifice is okay. And if we, we can't believe the hockey stick, because the hockey stick would suggest that self-interest, i.e. when people are left free to pursue their own self-interest, is a good thing. And we can't, we can't even accept that self-interest is a good thing. Then we reject the hockey stick. Or we find other explanations, or we invent stuff that's about a science fiction. Well, all you have to do is, is read, read Paul Krugman and Stiglitz and all these idiots. And, I mean, they used to be economists, but they forgot or they ignore. And the reason they can get away with it is because that's what we want to believe. We want to believe capitalism is no good. There's no other explanation. Again, we've had the best economists in the world. We've made the best economic arguments that have ever been made. We've had our Hayek's and Mises and even Milton Friedman who popularized a lot of this stuff. They, they made the arguments. Nobody's convinced. At least not in the West. Right? You guys have had a slightly different trajectory, so maybe there's hope over here. But my view is we have to fight a moral battle. We have to reject the morality that says that sacrifice is good. Because there's an obvious question to ask, why? Why should I sacrifice? Why be selfless? Why is somebody else's life more important than mine to me? As far as I know, I only have one life on this planet. Actually, I actually do know that I only have one life on this planet. It's not just as far as I know. One life. Why not make the most of it? Why not live for me? Why do I have to live for you? Why is your life more important to me than my life? I mean, that's nuts. That's ridiculous. So what we need, and this is what Ayn Rand really contributes to this discussion. This is why I encourage you all to read Atlas Shrugged, The Fountainhead, The Virtue of Selfishness. What she adds to this discussion is a different moral code. A moral code that says no. Your life is not secondary. Your life is primary. Your moral responsibility is not to others. Your moral responsibility is to yourself, to your own life, to make your life the best life that it can be to pursue your own happiness and achievement. That entrepreneurs are not heroes because they help the world. They're entrepreneurs because they make the most of their own life. Because they take risks and they get rewards. They challenge themselves. They apply themselves. They work hard and they reap the benefits, not just financially, but spiritually as well. That's what makes them good guys. And oh, by the way, they make the world a better place. But a moral code that is focused on self-interest is the only moral code consistent with liberty and freedom. Because what are we talking about when we talk about liberty and freedom? We're talking about liberty and freedom for the individual to pursue their own life. But is that right? Is that moral? Is that just? Not according to a morality of sacrifice. No, your responsibility is to others, not to yourself. 
pursuing your own self-interest, who cares? It's okay to control if we believe that that control is going to be good for society or good for the public or good for the poor or good for some class of people who are miserable right now. They're the standard, not you, not your life, not your values. So we need a morality that focuses on self. We need a morality that says to live means to live well. It means to live the best life one can live for oneself. And then what moral philosophers should do is study human nature, study history, study psychology, and determine these kind of values and virtues, which is what morality is about, values and virtues, are good for human beings, and these values and virtues are bad for human beings. These lead to happiness, success, flourishing, and these lead to death and destruction and misery and unhappiness. We know what leads to destruction and unhappiness. What would be great if we discovered what leads to success and happiness? That's what we should be focused on. That's what we should be thinking about. And then we need to be advocating for that kind of morality. A morality of success and flourishing. Now, I, we don't have time to get into uh, too deeply into this morality, but I want to I emphasize one idea from Ayn Rand in terms of what that morality implies. What does it really mean to live for yourself? What does that require to live for oneself, to make one's own life the best that it can be? What is the one thing, the one value that one must pursue if one takes one's own life seriously? If you want to have a really, really good life. What is the, what is the one value that is required for human survival? and certainly required for human flourishing. Reason. Our minds, everything we have, all the values that we have, material and spiritual, ultimately come from the use of our reason, from the use of our mind. They come from observing reality, figuring it out, and applying it. That's what entrepreneurs do. That's the essence of entrepreneurship. The essence of entrepreneurship is thinking. Figuring stuff out, finding opportunities, having a new idea, testing it. We talked about testing. Testing it in the marketplace, but not testing it as a fantasy, not testing it and then wishing it away, not testing it and then faking the results, but actually dealing with the actual result, which is actual reality, which is what reason demands of us. It means taking science, which is reason, and applying it to reality, which might be on engineering or entrepreneurship and coming up with new stuff, new ideas. But this is not just in business, this is life generally. Good stuff happens when you figure it out, when you think about it, when you use your mind, when you use your reason, when you apply yourself. Living on your emotions alone, and I know this is hard for libertarians to hear. <laughs> Inside joke. Um, leads to destruction, leads to bad stuff. There's a lot of stuff that's appealing in the moment, but not appealing long term. There's a lot of stuff that I feel good right now, but it's not good for you in the long term. To be truly self-interested means to truly invest in thinking and figuring out what's good for you, not just today, not just tomorrow, but over your lifespan. And that's hard. I like to say being self-interested is really, really hard work. It requires a lot of thinking. A lot of figuring out. Just like being an entrepreneur is really, really hard work. And in the middle, you might discover you've made a mistake. And you have to readjust. That's true in life. That's true in business. That's certainly true as an entrepreneur. You hire people that you thought were good. They turn out not to be good. You have to be realistic. You have to fire them. Now, in America, that's hard. In some countries like Sweden, it's almost impossible. I don't know what it's like in Poland. Hopefully you can still fire and hire people freely. Uh, but that requires figuring out having the courage to apply your thinking in reality. So if you had to boil down Ayn Rand's ethics to one idea, it's think, think, think. Figure out what's in your rational, long-term self-interest. What's going to make you the happiest, the most flourishing, the most successful you can be 
as a human being in your life. And what's the enemy of thinking? What's the enemy of thinking? What is the condition under which thinking is useless? Emotion. Well, emotion you can overcome, right? Emotion you can override through your thinking. But what condition do you, can you live under where you can't override it? Force. Force. Somebody points a gun at you and says, from now on, 2 plus 2 equals 5. And if you act differently, I'm shooting you. It's hard. You can't program a computer. You can't build a bridge. You can't do basic math. Compulsion, coercion, force is the fundamental enemy of human thought. Just ask Galileo. Oh, well, Galileo got off easy, right? Because he only went at a house arrest. Others in his same situation are burnt at the stake or crucified because they thought something that wasn't allowed to be thought. And that kills that thought, and it disincentivizes anybody else from thinking that thought. So if you want to destroy progress, if you want to destroy reason, then you embrace compulsion, you embrace, embrace coercion, you embrace force. And that's why the non-aggression principle is true. That's the moral basis for the non-aggression principle. It is the fact that aggression is anti-reason, therefore aggression is anti-human life. Aggression is anti-progress. Aggression is anti-happiness. So we want a government, we want a political system, we want a culture that rejects coercion, that rejects force. And that's the political system, the economic system of capitalism. A system of freedom, a system of entrepreneurs. Entrepreneurs that can come up with any idea. They can invent anything. And you know what the test is? We are, the marketplace is. Not some bureaucrat, not somebody with a gun, but the marketplace for goods, services, and ideas. That's the testing ground. Are people willing to pay more than what it costs or not? That's the testing ground. That's what freedom allows. Freedom to act, but most importantly, freedom to think. So what we need, if we're going to bring about a better world, what we need if we're going to bring about a world in which entrepreneurs can be free to produce and create what they will, what we need if we want to bring about a world of constant economic growth and success is a new morality, a morality that's pro-thinking, a morality that's pro the individual, that's pro self-interest, that's pro entrepreneurs and freedom. And that's a morality of self-interest. So for the sake of human happiness and for the sake of, what was it, three generations, we were going to get poorer? Um, let's work for a real moral revolution, not just for a political and economic revolution. Thank you all. Okay, so I, I purposefully left plenty of time for Q&A. So do we want to circulate a mic or? This question first. Okay. I know what he's going to ask. Thank you very much. I'm sorry to talk about this. Great, as always. You talked about entrepreneurship today, so since you're so resourceful that you're not only talking about entrepreneurship, but about many things, given the current hysteria in the Western world, or like the reaction towards several terrorist attacks in the last couple of months, especially in Paris very recently. I personally, as a libertarian, am very struggling with how I, I should answer my friends who ask me. So, what do you think libertarians think? Or what, what do you think the of a free and open society think? How we should react as a society, but also how policymakers should react um, to these ethnic threats we're having? 
And um, I think student celebrity is a great forum to discuss different standpoints and shape your opinion so that we actually as young libertarians and democracies can shape our opinion. And I would highly appreciate if you could um, tell us what you think how an open and free society should react to um, terrorism. Both on foreign policy, but also domestic security policy. Okay, so let me start by saying this does not represent a libertarian perspective because most libertarians hate what I'm going to about to say, um, and hate me as a consequence. Um, so I think I, I think we have to separate the situation in Europe into two separate issues for a moment, and then we'll unite them, right? And the two issues have to do one issues of national security and defense foreign policy, and migration, which I think are two separate issues. They're united right now, but they're only united right now because we don't have a foreign policy and, and nobody, nobody's willing to talk about foreign policy. Nobody's willing to talk about terrorism. We pretend that we're fighting wars. We pretend that we've got some agenda here, but it's all, you know, it's all pretend. It's all, sh it's all mirrors and smoke and mirrors. Um, my view is that there's a war going on that the West refuses to acknowledge. And yeah, there's a terrorist attack here and a terrorist attack here, and they're small scale, and it's not that many people die in the big picture, right? But it's only going to intensify because we do nothing about it, and it's only going to grow, and it's only going to become bigger, and one day they might have bigger weapons, like, you know, uh, uh, like bigger bombs, and, and uh, maybe they'll get better at using whatever little limited weapons they have. But this is a war that's been going on I mean, I date it from uh, November 4th, 1979, the day the Iranians uh, took the U.S. Embassy, and it's just been accelerating slowly, on and off, kind of over the periods. And it's basically a war between a certain sect of the Islamic world, I call them Islamic totalitarians, jihadis, fundamentalists, whatever you want to call them, and the West. They hate us. They hate us for good reason. We stand in contradiction to everything they believe. There's a war. The only job of government, in my view, is to protect us from exactly this kind of thing. That's it. It's the only thing they're supposed to do. So do your job. Find the bastards and kill them. <laughs> and I'm not talking about a few terrorists here and there, because those are just tools of powers far greater than the few terrorists. They, terrorism doesn't exist without state support. It doesn't exist without weapons. It doesn't exist without training. It doesn't exist without money. And this, we know who gives them the money. We know who gives them the weapons. We know who gives them all of this stuff. And yet we pretend we don't. We, we live in this fantasy, oh, ISIS. So, you know, who's ISIS? ISIS didn't exist a few months ago. And suddenly it's the biggest enemy in the world. Who funded ISIS? Who created ISIS? Who made ISIS possible? Well, it's the same elements who made 9-11 possible. It's the same people who made all these attacks possible. It's basically two countries in the world who fund all the terrorism in the world. And we pretend that it doesn't exist. So this continues. Saudi Arabia, which funds all Sunni terrorism in one way or another. Uh, the government doesn't do it, they funnel it through foundations, and it's the Wahhabis, it's not the Saud family, and it's complicated. But who cares? It comes out of Saudi Arabia. And it's Iran who funds all the Shiite terrorism in the world. And you might not feel Shiite terrorism in the world, but if you're in Argentina, and you happen to be in the Jewish community center a few years ago, it was blown up and 200 people died, worse than Paris. And that was Shiite terrorism in action. Two countries. So instead of going to Iraq and to Afghanistan and bombing Syria, there are only two countries that matter in the entire Middle East, and those are the two. So I would defeat them and thus destroy the entire terrorist network and make it so that it was, let's put it mildly, unprofitable to attack the West. But before that, Politicians, our political leadership needs to declare war. It needs to tell us what victory looks like. And during that period when you have a war, it's legitimate to do things like restrict immigration for the period when there's a war, which you know is going to go away when the war ends. Or even, God forbid, listen into some phone calls here and there, right? But the problem is today what we have is no war, no victory, no enemy. Like a bunch of terrorists. It's like after World War II, after Pearl Harbor declaring war on kamikaze pilots. Because you're afraid to name Japan as the enemy. 
right? So what we have today is an endless war, no end to it. So they can listen to everything we say. Hello, NSA. Um, they can do whatever the hell they want. They can restrict immigration, and there's no end to it because there's no victory. There's no definition of what a victory looks like. So liberties are gone, the state grows, it becomes more powerful, more restrictive, more oppressive, all in the name of defending us while they're not defending us at all. So as liberals, or libertarians, or objectivists, I believe in f open borders, I believe in free immigration. But I also believe in defeating the enemy. So if we had a proper foreign policy, we would declare war, we would limit immigration for the period of that war, we would crush the enemy, and then allow immigration again. Uh, so so that would be, that would be my, my short answer to that, because you can go on and on, and I'm sure people have questions, and some of you want to kill me, but so be it. Yeah? Uh, because I'm depressed by your great talk, uh, and, and we, your enthusiasm, uh, I have one question. Uh, you So can I, can I answer that quickly? So, so can I answer that quickly? Yeah. So I've been in Europe for two weeks now. I've given, this is my 14th talk. Other than three, all the other talks, well maybe, maybe other than five, all the other talks were in front of socialists. So I agree with you. But, but, there, but there's another point. And that is, yes, all of you are anti-statist. But my argument was not that the state is bad, that not is capitalism good. My argument that if we want to win, we need to embrace a certain moral code, which I will guarantee most of you have not accepted, because I asked how many were objectivists at the beginning, and very few of you raised your hands. So my goal is not just to say liberty is good, capitalism is good. My argument is to say self-interest is good. The morality of self-interest indeed is the only way we're going to defend capitalism, we're going to defend liberty. And if you try to do it any other way, you will fail. So I think there is a, a, a skeptical audience uh, with that regard, even in this room. Yes, but you have answered my question, and what the last word which I would like to say. Uh, what are the Yeah, so my view is the only way to convince the people, and it's going to take a long time. This is not, this is not, I know you're young, so you think, bam, everything's going to happen like that. This is decades long campaign that we are, all of us hopefully, are engaged in. This is going to take a long time because the changes are fundamental. They're not just superficial. It's not just about getting them to vote a particular way or another way because that goes up and down, that changes, and politicians, once they get into power, are very different than what they are before they get into power. This is about changing people's fundamental beliefs, and that takes a long time. And the arguments you have to make are the arguments I believe I made, the arguments Ayn Rand makes, the arguments they in these books. They are arguments about morality, about the purpose of individual's life. And it, Unless you can make those arguments and then convince them that the way in which, the only way in which they can pursue their own happiness, that A, that's a good thing to pursue your own happiness, and B, the only way to pursue that happiness is through liberty and freedom, that's it. That's what you have to continuously do. And it, again, it's going to take a long time, and it has to be focused on young people. Because after the age of 30, almost nobody changes their mind about anything important in life. I'm serious. This is like, you know, we're like the... the uh, it's all about young people. When we are talking about the way of thinking of the Polish professors at the university. Oh yeah, forget the professors. <laughs> in Poland, in everywhere, forget the professors.
You focus on young people in high school and in college. The, the, you know, from, the beautiful thing about human beings is at about age 14, we get this rush of hormones. And this rush of hormones makes us doubt everything. It makes us doubt authority, it makes us doubt our professors, it makes us doubt our parents. That's your entry point. That's where you say, oh, you're doubting? Here's some new ideas. Then it's when you're 14 to when you're 25, it's cool to be radical. Well, the left's not radical, the left's boring. The left's the same, you know, everybody's a leftist. We're the radicals. We're the cool ones, right? Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I had a question uh, regarding uh, the link uh, between uh, the morality of uh, selfishness uh, and uh, the objectivist uh, approval uh, for the laissez-faire uh, policy, uh, which uh, still seems a little bit uh, obscure to me. Uh, honestly, uh, I think uh, that uh, the letter uh, does not follow uh, from the former. Uh, let us uh, assume that uh, I'm a well system officer and uh, the totally unhandled market, as uh, Ayn Rand uh, described it, is uh, going to be introduced uh, by the libertarian or uh, objectivist uh, politicians uh, who have uh, just... Uh, just tr try to make the question faster because we got lots of questions in limited time. Uh, it is uh, for certain that uh, I'm going to be worse yes. under free market regime. Why shall I not defend the state's because uh, yeah. my own Because it's just not true that you'll be worse off. You're going to be much better off. So you're stuck in a job that is not challenging, not interesting, where you're getting paid to do nothing. Which, let me, let me finish. Which is not fulfilling, which is, does not give you self-esteem. But more than that, the general standard of living in the society you live in is lower because under capitalism, the general standard of society would be much higher. Whatever you enjoy by being, I don't know, your welfare worker, whatever you enjoy is being a welfare worker in a socialist environment, you can become a social worker under capitalism, enjoy a much higher standard of living because everybody else becomes more productive. You remember that the, 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 the previous speaker talked about the fact that other people's ownership of stuff makes your life better? It does. Your life is much better when other people are producing. Your standard of living goes up. Oh, that's the guy who asked five questions. One <laughs> this time. I'm worried. Um, <laughs> but, but let me flip it. Let's say you're the recipient, because this, this is an important point I want to make. Let's say you're a recipient of wealthy. So not a wealthy worker. You're not actually working for a living. You're getting a check, and you're not working. You would say you're worse under capitalism, and I say no. You are living a pathetic, miserable life. There is no such thing as being happy and receiving welfare. There is no such thing as being happy and receiving welfare. It goes anti-human nature. To be happy, you have to have self-esteem. To have self-esteem, you have to take care of yourself. When you're dependent on other people, you cannot have self-esteem. When you know you are basically surviving by stealing. You do not have self-esteem. Crooks do not have self-esteem. Bernie Madoff was not happy, was a miserable, pathetic human being. Welfare recipients who just live off the dole of government are not successful human beings. They are not living a happy, successful life. If you're poor and you're, you're a bricklayer and you're, you're making a little bit of money, but you know that you're feeding yourself and you know you're feeding your family, and you know you're putting a roof above the head of your family. You have pride. You have self-esteem. You can be happy even though you're dirt poor. When you get a check from the government, this is why welfare is so evil. Because it institutionalizes a whole group of people into not just poverty, but unhappiness, misery, lack of self-esteem. So if you, the, 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 the connection between um, Self-interest is not a superficial self-interest. We're talking about self-interest as qua human being. The full potential, the full capacity as a human being. Not just the check. We're not materialists. I don't believe in just money. I believe in the, what we are as a spiritual being. That requires a lot more than getting handed a check. You need to work on it. That's why I said self-interest, 
hard work. 90% of the people, 99% of the people out there in the world are not self-interested. They don't know how to be self-interested. We haven't taught them how to be self-interested. They just breeze through life without ever engaging this. And that's not self-interest. That's not... And to be self-interested and to be incentivized, you need freedom. Yeah. Uh, One. Well, <laughs> uh, you talk about uh, the thinking, the reason is that uh, way we need to obtain to, to make our lives better. But uh, the Frank Oppenheimer uh, wrote that there are two uh, means, uh, two ways of getting better, well, getting richer, etc. There are political means and uh, economic means. Yes. And the problem with the thinking uh, is that someone could that my predecessor said that uh, someone could think he would use violent uh, force to get his uh, wealth. And uh, it connects with the first point, uh, I know. <laughs> you, you said people think tax, people say tax the rich. Why uh, do they say that? I think they say that because uh, today our capitalism is the uh, that shitty kind of the crony capitalism and there is full of those who use government use so I, I get it. We don't have a lot of time. No so, I get it. So first of all, let me address the second one. It's just not true. It's just not true. Most of the people who are wealthy, and the previous speaker said the same thing, most of the people who are wealthy in America today are self-made millionaires. They are self-made in that they created. They're not cronies. The number of cronies is limited. Yes, if you're a banker, you're a crony. But why are you a crony? I I'll tell you the Microsoft story, and, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll take the next question. So the Microsoft story, Microsoft used to spend, you know how much Microsoft used to spend on uh, lobbying in Washington, D.C.? Zero. So in the early 1990s, Microsoft spent no money on D.C., no money on politics. They didn't have a building in D.C., and they were brought in front of the Senate. And this Republican senator stood up and said, you guys have to start spending money on D.C. You have to start lobbying. We're going to screw you if you don't. And you better build a nice building in Washington, D.C. And the Microsoft guy said, look, you leave us alone, we'll leave you alone. We don't want cronyism. We just want to do our thing. Guess what happened the next year? The Justice Department came after Microsoft. For what? For giving us a product for free. Internet Explorer. It was clear retribution. Guess how much money Microsoft spends today in Washington, D.C.? Tens of millions of dollars. They have a beautiful building in the center of Washington. So cronyism is a feature of government. And by the way, there's no such thing as crony capitalism. All cronyism is statism. All cronyism is statism. There's crony socialism. There's crony fascism. There's crony statism. Capitalism is free of cronyism. But again, most rich people today, in America at least, made their money the good way. Do they, is there an element of cronyism? You have to, otherwise you're dead. You have to play the game a little bit. But that's not why. Now the previous question, um, people think it's in their self-interest to use force on others. I strongly, strongly recommend that you read The Virtue of Selfishness, which is now available in Polish. So you have no excuse not to read it. <laughs> and she explains in great detail there why it is never in your self-interest to use force on another person. Why stealing is not, doesn't make you a happy, successful, better person. That indeed it makes you l miserable and lousy. And all you have to do is, is, is have you, anybody ever met, well, I'm afraid to ask, right? Anybody ever met a happy politician? I have not. I have not. They are miserable, pathetic creatures who are continuously, continuously stressed and anxious because their power... This is, not, this is not living a successful life as a human being, living as a politician. They have power over people. Uh, Stalin was miserable, was hateful. All of these guys are. Whether they're little politicians or big successful dictators, they are not succeeding qua human beings. So they are not self-interested. They are, power lusting is not in your self-interest. Power lusting is a, it's not altruistic, but it's neither. There's a third category. I call it self-destructive behavior. 
People who steal are committing self-destruction. People who, people who mooch are self-destructive. Politicians, for the most part, are self-destructive. Life requires certain things to be successful, to be truly happy, to flourish as a human being. And those things are objectively true. You have to figure out what they are. It's not obvious. It starts with thinking. And thinking, you know, it, it's very rare that people sit down and think, so I, I'm talking about the corporate world, you know, politics. It's very rare uh, that people sit down and think in the corporate world, I want to be happy, successful, I, I want to live the best life that I can live. So I'm going to steal money from my shareholders. <laughs> Nobody ever does that. What they do is they don't think. They see a pile of money and they take it. Not because they're thinking, I want, to be a good, I want to be a successful person. No, they just take it because it's the, it's, it's a, they're motivated by their emotions. They're motivated by whim. Because if they thought about it, think about Bernie Madoff. Everybody know Bernie Madoff was? Created this big pyramid scheme. All pyramid schemes fail. They all collapse. At the end, he was bound to be caught at some point, right? So the only reason he did it is because he never thought about it. He said, there's a pile of money, I'm going to steal it. There's another pile of money, I'm going to steal it. And one day... You know, he's stolen all this money and he gets arrested and he goes to jail. And by the way, Bernie might have says he's happier in jail than he was before he was caught. And I believe him. Because stealing and lying and cheating is a miserable form of existence. Well, yep. only the fat guys who believe that. <laughs> People don't believe it. It's not a question of believing it. It's a question of whether you believe it. It's not a question of whether the crook believes it. The crook is miserable already. Yeah. Well, yeah, I as well am an expert of uh, and I as well am rather skeptical when it comes to the establishment. Yeah, I'm sure you are. You see, I have a lot of persuading to do. Yeah. That's not the point I'm trying to make. Okay. It probably comes down to uh, persuasion. You said that we should make a moral case for capitalism and free yeah. um, But don't you think that people are mostly guided by attention and, and brain stem when it comes to morals? Then it's even harder to persuade them on a moral level rather than on an on economic level. Yes. I agree completely. It's harder to convince people on a moral level than it is to convince them on the economic level. Much harder. But it's the only convincing that counts. Because then they interpret their economic understanding based on what their morality is. This is why you can teach them that minimum wages don't work and they still vote for minimum wages. You can show them the destruction of socialism and they still want to be socialists. I'll give, you, I'll give you an example right now is happening in the world. Venezuela used to be the richest country in Latin America on a per capita basis. Richest people in Latin America used to live in, Latin, in Venezuela. They elected a socialist. Today, they're the poorest country in Latin America. They barely have food. There's no toilet paper. There's no soap. People have to go out of Venezuela to bring in toilet paper and soap. That's how pathetic life is right now in Venezuela. Chile, what's that? Colombia. No, I mean Venezuela. Colombia is actually doing quite well. It's Venezuela. Chile, on the other hand. Chile used to be the poorest country in Latin America, but instituted capitalist policies because of the Chicago boys, and today is the richest country in Latin America on a capita, cap, pro capita basis. Who do you think the rest of Latin America wants to be? Venezuela or Chile? They want to be Venezuela. Now, you can't explain that based on economics. There's no economic explanation in the world that would justify wanting to be Venezuela. The only explanation for that is moral, that they believe the Venezuelan model is fairer, is more just, is more equitable. If we don't challenge that, we lose. We haven't been challenging that. We are losing. It's all about morality. Once you convince people that they should pursue their own rational self-interest, their own long-term rational self-interest, freedom is easy. Because it's the only system under which the pursuit of your own rational self-interest is possible. But it's hard to do, very hard to do. In a Catholic country, super hard to do. But that's the choice we have. It's all we have. And, and this is why I said this is going to take decades and decades and decades. This is a hard, hard battle. And it, it, you know, I know it's harder here when you're young because you want results quickly. I'm old now. I used to be young, so I, I, I know what it's like. But it's, that, that's the reality. So I'm not saying it's easy. I agree with you completely. It's much harder. 
But that's the battle that we have to engage in. Otherwise, we lose. And we are losing. And then, by the way, Chile, which is the richest country, just elected a socialist twice. And the socialist is undoing all the things that made them rich. They're doing it to themselves. Never mind other countries wanting to be them. It's unbelievable when you th if, you think, if you think people care about economics. Or, uh, you know, there's this myth in America that people vote their pocketbook, which means people vote how much money, you know, wh which candidate will provide them with more money. Uh, and yet, if that were true, we'd live in laissez-faire heaven. Because laissez-faire heaven makes us financially much better. Even those people on welfare would be financially better off and under laissez-faire capitalism. That's what the graphs show. Rich people, Obama, when he ran for president in 2012, promised to raise taxes on the rich. And he did raise taxes on the rich, a lot. Guess how the rich voted? The myth is rich are all Republicans. They never vote. It's not true. Eight out of the ten richest counties in America voted for Obama. In California, we have a referendum where everybody gets to vote to raise taxes on the rich from 10% to 13%. We're talking about Silicon Valley rich. 10% to 13% and Hollywood rich. Right? Guess how the rich voted? Silicon Valley overwhelmingly for raising taxes. Hollywood overwhelmingly for raising taxes on themselves. But that's how we get all these policies. Because it's moral. Because why are they raising taxes? Because they feel guilty. And, and the, the governor goes around saying, if we don't raise taxes on you, those people over there are going to suffer. We're going to have to cut education. We're going to cut welfare. We're going to do all these things. So, of course, to appease my guilt, I'm going to do it. That's it? Yes, thank you. Thank you, guys.